Joe Pishnery is an excuse is excused. Daniel Davidson. Here. Cindy Coza. Jonathan Hayes. Carla Burr. Here. Terry Dillon. Here. Adam Jenkins. Here. Brett Yancey. Here. Eric Adams. Here. Okay, thank you. So did everybody get a chance to look at the meeting minutes and go over them? Yes. Okay, do I have an approval or a motion to approve? Okay. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Let that pass. Okay. Oh, Cynthia, hold on. Oh, Cindy, I see you. I'm going to promote you to a panelist. Hi, Cindy. He's there. Okay. We it doesn't look like we have any attendees at this point. So okay. So do we in that case do we skip reading this? Yeah. Okay. 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 So since we have no uh, public testimony, we'll bypass the uh, instructions for testimony. And go to business without his business from the audience, and we don't need the committee response. So let's hear from the chief on the SPD update. Right. Thank you. Um, I've got several things. I just want to give you an update on going back several weeks, just give you updated on the most recent stuff. And if you have questions about anything that you're aware of, feel free to ask at the end of that. Um, on, at the end of August, we ran a shoplifting mission in conjunction with the um, loss prevention folks at the local Target. The second one of those we've run, the first one was not a Target, it was a Jerry's. But in four hours, we arrested 10 folks for shoplifting there at the Target. And the same day we ran this, that mission, it was just by coincidence that in, the Target Corporation announced that in Portland, they were shutting down three of their targets due to um, theft problems and safety for employees. And so that is the last thing we wanna see happen here at Springfield. And you know, we have our one Target here. The, the folks that work at that target loss prevention are very pleased with SPD, not just because of this mission, but just in our response in general. And it sounds like the loss level, this is what they're telling us, the loss level at this store in Springfield is less than some of the other ones around. And they largely attribute that to the, the proactive nature of what SPD is doing there and how responsive they are. So that was that, that felt good for them to recognize the fact that, you know, we're being responsive, we're going, we're taking the calls, we're in the missions with them. So hopefully we can nip that a little bud, nip it in the bud a little bit. And by publicizing on social media, maybe it has an impact. You know, if people are knowing if they're coming into Springfield to commit crimes like that, they might think twice about doing it and go somewhere else to do that. Not that we're going to be able to change your behavior necessarily, but we can definitely discourage them from doing that. So we did that at the end of August. Um, on August 20th, yeah. I'm sorry, can I ask you, uh, has Target uh, done any um, research on if that has lowered their loss or lowered the attempts? Uh, I don't know. I mean, what I was told by the officers that did it and what they heard from loss prevention was that the rate of loss at our store is less mm -hmm. than it is at some of the ones yeah. nearby. What we can attribute that to, I'm not sure. I mean, there could be a number of factors, but I think that's a positive sign. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. was just wondering if, if it has lowered the loss for our Springfield store as well. I don't know. Even even more so than what it was lowered. I don't know, I man. If I'm thinking they arrested 10 in four hours, there's probably okay. several more that we didn't catch during that same four hours. Yeah. Then you got to wonder during a full day how many people are walking out with stuff. And it's pretty staggering. Yeah. yeah it's staggering. Thank you. Sorry yeah, for you the interruption. I'm oh, sorry. Um, on the 29th, we had a hiring pro a hiring ceremony up here, and we hired uh, one lateral police officer that I feel really great about in particular, because that was officer of the year, I think, last year at the agency we took him from, so uh, that was a great pickup. We hired two lateral dispatchers. These are folks with, I think, roughly eight years of experience at a big agency, and so they have just assimilated very quickly um, here at SPD and are doing great, so that really helps out, because I think we were 
three vacant and that filled two of the vacancies. And actually next month we're gonna be hiring another lateral dispatcher. So we should be up to full staff here shortly, which is outstanding. Uh, we hired somebody into records and we hired three brand new officers that had no previous experience. And so they're all in training right now. Um, troll numbers, staffing numbers. So we have 55 officer positions at SPD and on paper right now, we have 50. So that's only five vacancies on paper, which is outstanding because over the last, since I've been here the last couple of years, we've been down to 10, 12, maybe even right. touched 15. We've gained a lot of ground. Now that being said, we've got a Lieutenant who's retiring, we've got a Sergeant who's retiring. We've got two officers that basically are just now retiring. Uh, we've got a couple, I think, that are on like a long-term medical leave. So it shows that we have 50 of 55. I mean, of that 50, you can subtract all those retirees. And then from there, we have three or four officers that are relatively new. So they're with a coach. So it's not like we can really use them on their own. So then you go down even further. So operationally, we're down kind of low. But when those folks um, are released from their coaches to come back out, it'll swing us back up. Um, we're going to be doing a hiring ceremony when the date set. I think it's going to be the first week in November. So we're going to be hiring some more, more folks coming up. So we are definitely making progress, but you can't ever take it for granted because it's just always a moving target with people coming and going for different reasons. Uh, on the 31st of August, this is a significant event that we had. We had two officers or three officers that responded to a call in the 1800 block of market. For a disturbance, there was a man that was reportedly out in the street throwing objects around his yard, just acting erratically. So the cops get there. The person had retreated back inside a home. They went up and knocked on the door of the home, trying to make contact with this person. And as they were knocking on the door, uh, gunfire erupted from inside the house. Um, we found out later that uh, the person inside the house had fired off 30 rounds in rapid succession from AR-15. Um, at least one of those rounds, maybe a couple more, had come through the front door and hit one of our officers in the foot, causing a significant injury. Uh, the officers did an outstanding job on the radio. They fell back. They administered emergency first aid to stop the bleeding. They evacuated that officer very quickly to the hospital. A lot of support showed up very quickly, not just SPD, but we had EPD SWAT. We had Lane County there. We had negotiators. We had officers. We had OSP was there. The offers to help from the FBI. I mean, when something like that happens, there's just an out, outpouring of immediate support offered by all the agencies around. Um, because of the great work the negotiators did, I think it was an hour-ish, hour and a half-ish, they talked the person into coming out of the house and surrender. So very fortunate that the officer or more officers weren't hurt, neighbors weren't hurt. In fact, even after the officer was shot and they fell back to the corner of the house, uh, the person continued to fire rounds for it might have been up to 10 or 15 minutes. Like they even cracked the front door open once and stuck the gun barrel of a rifle out the front of the front door of the house and fired more rounds off. So it was definitely a rapidly evolving kind of an incident. We're extremely fortunate that more cops weren't hurt, but it was significant. I mean, when you get an officer hurt, that's that's um, that's a big deal. And so how is he now? Uh, he's doing great. He is not back to work yet. I mean, the injuries are not insignificant. Right. I think he's expected to recover at some point in time, but he's got a lot of support from SPD. Um, his family's got a lot of support from us, just uh, doing everything we can to get him well and get him back to work. And that was a significant event for us, because as far as I know, we haven't had an officer actually injured by gunfire for 30, 40, 40 years. years. Yeah. 80s. Yeah. Oh. Knock on wood. That's a really good run. Yeah, excellent. Um, first or second week of September, we have the state canine conference here in Springfield. So there's uh, the Oregon OPCA, Oregon Police Canine Association, has a conference every year. And this year we volunteered to run it. So we had canine teams from all around the state for the whole week, running competitions and seminars and classes, uh, which I think largely went off very successfully, except for maybe some of the people that were trying to get some sleep in their hotels because the parking lot was full of cars with dogs barking all night. <laughs> other, than that, other than that, it was success. success. <laughs> exactly. Yes. exactly. Uh, 9 11, we put together a team of folks that went to Hudson Stadium along with um, first responder agencies, military folks, and their families uh, from all around the region to participate in the stair climb at Hudson. 
which is a pretty cool deal. I think it's 2,367 steps. Uh, it was a lot of work, but it was for a good cause and raised a lot of awareness. And it was just a great, it was a great event. A lot of people there, so it was, that was neat to participate in. Um, just last week, we had a homicide, which we don't have, I think on average, we have two-ish a year here at Springfield. We had one last week. It was very unique. It was at 42nd, around 42nd in Maine. You know, callers reported somebody down on the sidewalk and the officers got there. We found the person down. Um, and through what I think is outstanding old school detective work, knocking on doors and working the neighborhoods, finding some surveillance cameras and figuring out a car and then a, another person who was a witness. And then ultimately within, I mean, within 72 hours ish, we had a named suspect identified. We knew what car he was in and we had actually tracked him uh, to a relative's house in California. That person was in custody. I think we got like within 80 some hours of this homicide occurring. We had detectives jump in their cars, drive down to California and connect with the, the police agencies down there. And they were able to get the person into custody without any further incidents. So that was just another example of outstanding police work on the part of our detectives. Um, oh yeah, in addition to the recent hires we did, we called personnel transfers. We um, Officer Caitlin Gold had got, I went through a process, was selected to become a detective. So that's a big deal for cops here to get selected to be detective. She's just dove in the pool head first and working homicides and all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff. She's been there a matter of days, but she, she's doing great. Uh, we had some command changes. Lieutenant Nyber, who oversaw our jail operations, is retiring or essentially has retired. So Lieutenant Repay, who oversaw patrol operations, he's moved over to the jail. Sergeant Kirkpatrick has been made an acting lieutenant, a long-term acting lieutenant, essentially. So he has the uh, patrol operations now. So it's a little bit of a command change there. Um, Lieutenant Crawley is still overseeing the operations support division, which is detectives and some other things, but he's been running point on our accreditation project. So that started back in roughly April. Um, we were originally planning to have be done with it like March or May. But thanks to the work of Lieutenant Crawley and others in the department, they've really been hustling on this. And I think, I think we may be done early January. Wow. So we are getting close to being done with what we have to do with rewriting all the policies and everything. And then in January is when the members of the Oregon Accreditation Alliance team will come to SPD and basically do an evaluation of the organization from top to bottom. And as long as we have everything dialed in the way I hope we will, you will become accredited in the January. And Cindy is on here, right, Cindy? Thanks to Cindy and the reminder that she sent us here a couple of weeks ago, we've um, added a Spanish uh, language portion to the phone tree. So when you call the non-emergency number here, um, one of the first things you'll get if you're a Spanish speaker is the ability to follow a phone tree that's in Spanish. So that thanks for that. We got that done as quick as we could. Um, and so hopefully that has a positive impact on some of the folks in our community. And that covers my updates, unless I forgot something, Tiffany, and I'd be glad to answer any questions or anything else from it. That's right. I just would like to add that um, Tiffany, the airman, principal, oh, yeah. excuse me, yeah. um, else, I was very, very proud of our team. Yeah, we had a number of officers help with the motorcade yes. where we picked the motorcade up um, on I-5 North of Springfield and helped bring her into town and through town. And I was really impressed by the outpouring of support in the community yeah. as yeah, well. Yeah, I was, was too. Very impressive. It was too. That's that deal. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So thank you. That was it. Um, anything from any business from the committee? Any comments? Any questions for Chief? Um, I just wanted to say, sorry, I think I'm a little delayed here, but I just wanted to say thank you. Um, when I made the request directly to you, um, uh, I was not expecting an answer within the week and it was just like days and it really had a positive impact um, with my company, especially because I have about 170 employees and 20% of them only speak Spanish and they are taking care of some of the most vulnerable adults in Springfield. 
And a lot of those adults have protocols where we have to call the police. And um, it made a huge difference. And they, when I told them, it was like, wow, that happened really fast. Look at this action. And the, I, I just want you to know that it really meant a lot to our company and our um, employees. So that was really cool. Good. Thank you for that. I appreciate yes. that. Thank you for feedback. And just really quickly, I wanted to remind you of the culture minority community position is still open until tomorrow. Um, that was Brittany's position. And it was open, I think it started in September and then it closed and we must not have got any applicants. So they've reopened it. So if you know of anybody that would be a good fit for that position, please encourage them to apply by tomorrow <laughs> at five. <laughs> and if they have any questions, they can you can refer them to me and I can help them navigate the website if they need it or let them know what we're all about. And then the other thing I just wanted to remind Terry and I talked about this a little bit. And I just want to remind people uh, the committee that if you have any agenda items you'd like to see added to the agenda, please let me know by the Thursday before the meeting. So a week before the meeting. Thank you. Okay, do we want to talk about these policies? Uh, first one is policy 1.31, I guess. We typically put these together. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll kind of just uh, skim through both of these policies, but feel free to stop me if you have questions at any point in there. You can hit me up at the end and we've got to discuss certain portions of it. So this policy regarding arrests it just outlines when a police officer can make an arrest and it kind of talks about each of those different times through this policy. And those are probable cause arrests, warrant arrests, uh, citizens arrest, as we've all heard, like on TV shows, <laughs> and non-criminal custody. So to arrest somebody, we need to develop probable cause. Probable cause essentially is 51%. It's more likely than not, based on the totality of the circumstances, that I think they did this. You know, to, to convict somebody, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's a whole different standard that's much higher. But to arrest somebody, you just need to have 51% based on all the facts that you have in front of you that they probably committed this crime. So that's a standard police officers use to make an arrest or actually to even get a search warrant. It's a probable cause standard. You would write up a whole search warrant based on the totality of um, for a house or a car or something, and you take it to a judge. And if a judge feels like you're at the 51 percentile there, they'll sign the warrant and then you can proceed forward. But that's a totally different standard, like I say, than it is to actually convict somebody in court. Um, some of the language in here that stands out, you know, we're going to treat all individuals with respect. We're not going to physically mistreat or verbally harass any individual when we take them into custody. Um, and so arrest without warrants. So we can arrest somebody without a warrant, like I said, if you have probable cause. And that's that's essentially what that one says. I mean, there's a lot of other information in there, but it's, it's but you, you have probable cause. You don't need a warrant to arrest somebody. Um, you can arrest people with Restraining order violations, if you have a restraining order that's signed and it has been delivered to the person that is not supposed to have contact and it's been filed, if somebody violates that restraining order, you can arrest somebody for the violation of the restraining order. Um, there's a couple, two or three different types of restraining orders in there it talks about. You can talks about the warrant arrest. We have to confirm warrants because there's warrants that get entered from courts you know, all around the state, all around the country. And we have to confirm the warrant with the court before we can make that arrest. So if I run your name in the computer and it says that you have a warrant, that's fine. That agency has entered it into the computer, but we call dispatch and dispatch physically has to call the agency that um, entered that warrant to confirm that it's still good, that it's real before we make that arrest and book somebody into custody. Uh, Non-criminal custody. So that's when we can take somebody into custody that essentially if we can articulate that they present an immediate danger to themselves or somebody else uh, because of something's going on with them. It might be a level of intoxication. It might be suffering from some kind of mental illness and they're exhibiting behaviors that make it very clear to articulate 
they're an immediate danger to themselves or somebody else, then we can take them into custody. And most of the time, they are taken to a local emergency room for an evaluation by a doctor and then maybe placed on a, uh, we call it, uh, we place them on a police officer hold and then the doctor can also place them on a hold if he determines that they, they pose that immediate danger to themselves and get them the treatment that they need. Uh, citizen's arrest, it's called arrest by private person in here. Again, the standard is probable cause. A person has to believe there are 51% to make that arrest. They can use a reasonable amount of force to take that person into custody. They have to turn them over to the police or call the police. Um, it's a pretty rare circumstance, I think, that somebody should attempt to arrest somebody else if they're not a police officer because it can go any number of different ways, and most of those ways are not good. So if you think you have somebody that should be arrested for something, then you think you have probable cause for them. I mean, absent some kind of very significant exigency, my advice would be to call 911, call the police to come make that arrest for you because that might end a whole different way that you might think you would when you go to tackle somebody and tell them they're under arrest. They, they might not want to go with the program. <laughs> but you still have to have that probable cause standard. Um, the U.S. Prevention Act on the last page. So with domestic violence, if we have probable cause that there was a domestic violence incident that occurred, um, we do not have the discretion to not arrest somebody. Sometimes with certain crimes, like I might have probable cause, but I don't have to arrest you necessarily. Maybe we, I could write a report, I could document. There's different things that we can do, but I'm not mandated to arrest you just because I have probable cause that, you know, maybe you stole it along or I'm not obligated to arrest you with some discretion. But when it comes to domestic violence, if we show up at a scene where there is probable cause to believe that one of the parties has committed some kind of domestic violence, even very, very minor, we are mandated to take that person into custody and take them to jail. And the reason that law, and that's a, that's a, not just our policy, I mean, that is the state, uh, there's an ORS state law about that. And I think what that's for is uh, we don't want that discretion because there's just, there's too many times, I think, in the past where that might have happened. The police showed up and everything seemed fine. Everybody promised not to fight anymore. The police left and maybe somebody ended up injured very badly or worse. And so I think to protect the people involved there, it's a, it's a mandatory arrest when it comes to domestic violence. Uh, peace officer authority out of the state. We can actually, we have police authority anywhere in the state of Oregon. Any sworn uh, law enforcement officer of any state local agency in Oregon can make an arrest and arrest somebody anywhere in the state. We typically wouldn't do that. We would call the agency where we were and ask for help, but we can. But we have no police powers outside of the state, which is interesting. Like when our cops went down to California the other day for the homicide suspect, they could not have arrested the, that suspect. They can go down there and might be able to get an eye on the house, watch surveillance. But if there's some police action that needs to happen, we don't have any more authority in California than a citizen does. So that's just something we have to keep in mind, especially for cops that work right on the border of some of these states and things happen back and forth all the time. You don't have any authority once you cross that line. So in that situation, if it would have become violent towards the local police department, could our officers step in and assist in that case? Yeah, like any citizen. Just as a citizen. They would have, yeah, they're, they're not sworn police officers, but they can take the same action gotcha. that any community member could. Yeah. Um, that is the arrest policy. So if you have any other questions in on your review, feel free to ask them. I did have one. So how often are these updated? Because um, Sacred Heart University District is identified in here and I believe that's closing. Closing. So how often, is that just an administrative thing when something like that happens, you guys just made that administrative change? Or yes, we, go through a whole process? we can go back to our policies. I mean, I can, I can, in theory, you change the policy tomorrow. If there's gotcha. something like that, I could just take that out, re-sign it. You know, we have the city attorney look at it. We have our bargaining unit look at it. But if nobody has any concerns with changing that policy, it's very we can do it very quickly. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of talk. About that. Yeah. 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 And so this many. this particular one was updated July 6th because George is doing the accreditation policy. So that happened after that. <laughs> so we can't we can't change. Oh. Oh, I have a question. Sorry. Um, so can the police officers make the determination that an individual is not of sound mind and therefore they would just not take them into custody? Or like, how do they make that kind of decision? When you say sound mind, I mean, that's not one of the standards. For us to take somebody into custody absent a crime, 
where we have no probable cause, they have to, we have to articulate that they pose an immediate threat of, you know, death or serious physical injury to themselves or somebody else. So just not being of sound mind isn't enough for us to take them into custody. They have to have articulate, right. articulate that they're trying to kill themselves or their, or something like that. I think it, so in my experience, the trend that I see with the clients that I'm working with is many of them are nonverbal or they are just limited um, with their words and they're, they're doing real crimes like hurting themselves, hurting others, destroying property. Um, and when the officers come out, it's, I'm, you know, it's this, um, conversation about how they're not of sound mind and, you know, just take them to the emergency room sort of thing. But if they didn't have a disability and it was somebody else, they would probably be arrested. So I was just curious how, um, they're making some of these determinations and if that's addressed at all. Well, that's going to be on a case by case basis. So it's hard to speak to that because I mean, there's, there's contacts that go on every day and I can't speak to every one of them, but I mean, as a police officer who's shown up in situations where you have someone who is, you know, developmentally disabled or, or in the throes of some kind of mental illness and they, you know, maybe they broke, I don't know. They, they broke something at your house. They broke the door or they broke a vase or something. Well, you might be able to say on one in one circumstance, that could be a criminal mischief. That's a crime. You can't break my door. But you're also balancing the fact that this person, did they were they intentionally trying to commit this crime? Did they even understand what they did? Um, is a is a criminal court the answer or going to jail the answer for somebody that was like suffering from mental illness or some, something else going on where if we really need to take that person and put them into the jail system, is that the appropriate thing to do given that particular circumstance? And that's where officers have a lot of discretion because there is no black and white answer. Everyone's going to have a different set of facts and require kind of that evaluation uh, at, at the at the event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the trend that I'm seeing is that they opt not to take them in when like maybe other people are like afraid um, people that they live with are afraid or um, the neighbors are afraid. And um, the trend that I see is that they're like, um, well, they don't really know what they're doing. So therefore, you guys have to kind of deal with them. And um, so I just kind of thought it was interesting because if it was just anybody else, I feel like they'd probably arrest them and take them in. And so I, I was just curious if there was a policy about it, but that's, I mean, like I say, it's discretionary. And if it were, a, I mean, if someone was entirely of sound mind and knowingly committed a crime, maybe arresting them and putting them in jail is the right answer for that person. But it might not be the right answer for someone else who is uh, in, a, in a different situation. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating yeah. for all of us. It's frustrating for all of us. We want to solve the problem. We want to show up. We want to give everybody what they want. We want to solve the problem. But the system that is in place right now is just not, I don't think it's properly set up to be able to solve every problem the way everybody wants it right now, unfortunately. Yeah, I think, you know, we're just kind of like, you know, caregivers who are trying to take care of really violent people who get, sustain serious injuries. There's, there's been caregivers in the news recently who have been killed in Southern Oregon and in Portland. And um, I'm sure that, you know, the police have responded to, you know, violent outbursts from these individuals before it had escalated to these kind of extreme points. So I know that my staff are often very scared. The neighbors can be scared. And then it's kind of like, you know, it's, they don't know what they're doing. So it's okay. Just leave it sort of thing. So. Okay, I appreciate that. That's something I can talk to folks about and see what what kind of trends there. Like Elka Hoots to come help the family with some service uh, options, uh, don't you yeah, think? No, yeah. Well, Cahoots, yeah, Cahoots usually shows up and then leaves. Like we really, like we call the police probably five or six times a week. And then I would say we call Cahoots twice as much for like all the programs in Springfield. So we have like a lot of involvement and Cahoots usually shows up and then leaves. And we've had situations where, you know, the cops and the Cahoots people just kind of talk to each other and they don't always agree either. So it's kind of always a little bit confusing, but for the most part, we're usually left with violent clients who have, um, you know, hurt people afterwards and, and whatnot. So it's just been a concern, you know, for us, but.
Right. Any more Any questions about the arrest policy? I have a couple of comments on the document. Yeah. Um, I know that it's already gone into effect, but um, just some, what, what, my first question slash comment is in the section on arrest without a warrant on mm -hmm. item number two. It says um, a peace officer may arrest a person without a warrant when the peace mm -hmm. officer is notified by telegraph. Do we get anything by telegraph anymore? Yes, we have. We have somebody assigned to sit there and get <laughs> telegraph messages. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I, I kind of want to leave that in there just for the historical perspective. I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> no, we don't have a way to receive telegraphs here at SPD. <laughs> I, I, I assume so. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need to get one. <laughs> um, and then the other one is in uh, the non-criminal custodies section. That first paragraph, it says a crime twice. A crime, a crime. In which section? That means, it, that means it's really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a bad, bad crime. Good catch. This has made it through like six people before it gets printed, and somehow that's not true. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Because they were doing it by telegraph. <laughs> yeah, they double tapped. <laughs> Thank you. All right, bias-based policing, ready to move on to that one? So the definition of bias-based policing is an inappropriate reliance on characteristics like race, ethnicity, color, national origin, language, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, economic status, homelessness, age, cultural group, disability, political affiliation, um, as a basis for providing different law enforcement services or enforcement. So basically what that means is if you are a member of any kind of protected class, police cannot target you for enforcement based on that protected class. We treat everybody the same. Um, we're going to provide law enforcement services equally, fairly, and objectively without discrimination. So that's what it says in the next paragraph. Um, there are reporting requirements. So when police officers conduct a stop of someone, there's a mask on the computer they have to fill out after every stop. And if you look at section 41526 there, it talks about all the things that we have to capture for every stop. The reason for the stop, the perception of the person's uh, race or national origin, the perception of the individual's gender, the perception of the individual's age. We have to document whether or not we conducted a search. And then we have to put the disposition of whatever enforcement action we took. Did they get a ticket? Did they get a warning? Did they get arrested? So those are requirements that we have to fill out after every stop. Now, we report all of that to the state every year. And the state does what's called the, the stops report, where every single law enforcement agency in the state, um, they compile all those numbers and, and um, really release a report. And it's on the state website. And they send it to us. And I think what they're looking for, essentially, is are there agencies that show disparities in who they're stopping, who they're arresting, who they're searching. Um, that That's how we track and help prevent uh, bias-based policing by just capturing that kind of data. And I'm back, it talks more for the Criminal Justice Commission is who creates that report. EPSST, the, basically the police academy is involved. Um, people can file complaints with the state, if they think they've been discriminated against or a victim of bias-based policing, they don't have to just complain to SPD. I hope they do. I want to know, and I want to take those complaints. But people can also report those directly to uh, to the state, and then the state initiates an investigation and then reports that back to us. Um, so that's just another pathway people can file complaints about that kind of thing. They don't have to. If you're intimidated by whatever agency that you think is treating you poorly, you don't have to go to that agency to make the complaint. You can go directly to the state and make that complaint. Questions about bias-based policing? Carla, are you talking to us or? Yep, I'm talking to you. No, te <laughs> technically I was talking to my dog because you couldn't oh, hear me. Uh, no, I thought maybe you were asking a question. <laughs> no, I am. Um, so in section 41528, this is probably again, just me being a little bit picky, um, but it says the professional standards office shall annually provide blah, 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 but then in item D underneath that, it says the report shall be submitted no later than January 31st. Um, 
I feel like that we should add on to that something like for the previous year or by January of the following year. Like, I'm not sure how exactly that should be worded, but I feel like clarity on January 31st of when compared to the ask. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you. All right, I think those are the only two policies for this month, I believe. All right, all right. Thank you. All right. Anybody have anything to share? I'll share on behalf of the school district. So, um, first of all, I, I thought it would be appropriate to me just address the issue that has been shared with media on the fights that are happening in um, Springfield High School. And I would start by saying that the story has significantly mischaracterized um, the situation. I'll be clear that for the school district, any fight that happens is not an acceptable solution. We take this very seriously. Um, our school resource officers, Officer Newton and Officer Amundsen, are, are very, very, very helpful in those situations. They can determine whether or not there was any kind of crime committed, you know, an assault or, or whatever that looks like. And in some of those, that, that does occur. But that's really on the law enforcement side. Um, some of those, those fights, and unfortunately, I've, I've viewed a lot of the videos or all of the videos, um, some of those were not on campus. Some of those were not during school hours. Um, some of those, uh, you know, were were on campus. Um, there's been, you know, some of those have stories attached to them. It's it's unfortunate. Um, we have learned that uh, a lot of those were ninth grade students that should not have been on campus. We have a closed campus for ninth grade students, and so some of that had had bled off campus with that. But generally. Um, you know, we, we are, we're putting our procedures, reviewing our procedures, putting our supervision plans in place. Uh, and that goes for not, how are we going to prevent freshmen from leaving campus uh, during the lunch period, which means that we need to step up our supervision. Uh, so, so I just wanted to make sure that people understood that we do take that extremely serious. The safety of kids are, is our top priority, uh, for, especially for parents that are sending they're trusting us to to take care of our kids so uh, it's it's being addressed and um, i really appreciate the the sros because they they do outstanding. outstanding work and they do it very quickly so is there anything that you guys look at or have that is done outside of campus on social media do you guys do anything when they get back to the classroom yeah you know and that's uh, i believe and I, when I view the videos, and, and I'm sure you know a lot of you have seen similar videos, the really unfortunate part is that instead of somebody stepping in and disrupting the fight, they're surrounded by people that are just holding their cell phones and watching it and, and or cheering them on. And it doesn't stop until an adult steps in most of the time. And so I think that's the conversation is instead of being an active watcher of this, be an active interrupter of this. And if you, you know, obviously we don't want them to put themselves in harm, but find out how to get an adult or call the SRO or call, you know, the police or, or whatever that looks like. So I think that's the, that's the education and the reinforcement that is happening. Um, and a lot of times this isn't, most of the time, this is a pre-meditator or pre-planned -pre event. So when somebody hears about this, they need to be willing to come forward because a lot of that can be prevented ahead of time. Maybe not everything. I mean, you know, high school kids are—I mean, kids are going to fight. Uh, but but anything we can do to try to stop that is, is where we want to be. So just wanted to address that. I, I have talked to the chief about that, and I talked to, to Officer Newton and Officer all the time, and they're, uh, we're really really lucky to have them. Thank you. Anything else? Did we want to talk about what we talked about? Next we want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany and I were talking a little earlier. Um, 
we were wondering if we wanted to take this meeting from an every other month to a quarterly meeting at this point in time. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't restart up again. Uh, you know, for a while we were running it every month and then we went down to every other month as we're on today, but we've had a lot of people that don't show up a lot. And, and of course, during the summer, everybody's busy. So that puts a little kibosh on some, some of them. What we had to cancel last meeting, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so how does everybody feel about that? Would you, you know, like the already on reviews, if you had more reviews and make it a longer meeting? Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, uh, right now, a lot of times we finish our meeting in a half an hour, or, you know, 40 minutes yeah, or, or 40 something. minutes, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, we would go for the normal amount of an hour and a half, which is what we used to do. So of course you guys, or you have a vote too, as do you. I have a vote. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. What's your do, do you do any do you have an opinion on this, Carla, Christine? How about you guys? Uh, I would be opposed to going to a quarterly. Um, I think that uh, every other month is a hard enough to cadence for me to remember. Like, is this month on or is this month off? If we go to once a quarter, then it would be even more so. Um, and I kind of like that at least every other month, theoretically, we're scheduled to talk about a couple of the the policies. Um, and I think that if we, if we, um, if we made it quarterly, people who are going to miss, and I've been guilty of that myself, are going to be missing a greater percentage than they currently are. Yeah. Um, I think this meeting too is where the community can come and speak. I don't know if there's other platforms for that. If this is kind of the only opportunity for the, for the community to come in and have this kind of access. So I would just keep that in mind. I know a lot of people don't come from the community right now, but I also don't know if we're like really advertising and promoting that, um, but um, just something to be aware of and yeah. I know that I talked with Tiffany about losing some of the continuity that we established. So um, I would go either way, but I do think that we could lose some continuity. I know you were probably thrilled with what I was just <laughs> talking about. It. Since you only have you only have one or two other meetings, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I, I'm. If you want to do it every other month, I'm fine with that. Every quarterly it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. I think, and I don't want to violate any committee. City the bylaw committee says at least quarterly. Yeah, but I'm just thinking, like between meetings, if things come up that the committee members have questions, concerns about. You know, it's not like we have to wait two or three months to get the question answered. I want people to feel like you you always have access to the chief. It's like, you know, Cindy sent me that email the other day. She had a good idea. We we're able to implement it, pull it off. So it's not as though, like, you're right. The community can call in at these. And so it'll be a few lesser opportunities for the community to call into these. But we, I mean, we do get calls to the community all the time about things. And people do go to city council and they you know, speak at public comment at council every Monday night. And if there's police issues, they come up. This is, it's not like this is the only opportunity for the community of Springfield to get a voice with the police chief. Um, there, there's lots of avenues and ways to do that. It happens a lot. So I, that, that's a valid concern, but I don't think it's one that really is a, is a big issue because there's lots of avenues for people to get a hold of us with things. One other thing that I was thinking is that, um, Last year, we did a lot of looking at what is this committee's real, the intent of it and the job of it. And um, I would kind of like to see us doing more. Uh, I love going through the policies. I love reading them and seeing what's there. But if we could use this time to maybe plan other ways to coordinate, to help, or if this is all we are going to be doing, um, then maybe quarterly is enough. But if we could be doing more, I'd like to see us doing more. Okay. Um, 
I don't know if I have a strong opinion because I'm pretty new on the committee. Um, I do appreciate the virtual option. Uh, I, I would try to be here in person, but um, I have a lot of a lot of demands uh, for late night meetings as well. And so sometimes this is knowing it ahead of time and getting it on my calendar is is great. Okay. I also am committed to you know making sure that the school district is participating and active. Thank you. We appreciate. It. Um, yeah, similar to what Carl had said, I, I guess I was thinking along those lines and wondering and before we made a decision if, we, if it would be helpful to revisit some of the goals that we had set up as a committee and, and assess whether any, we would be effective at, at attaining those meeting on a quarterly basis. Admittedly, I, I can't remember exactly what all of them were off the top of my head right at this moment, so that could be useful. The other thing that I was thinking about, too, is with the um, cultural minority community member position being vacant, you know, that's maybe something, a decision that we would want to make after that position hopefully can be filled. So that's a good point. Um, but otherwise, is it just the impetus for shifting to quarterly? Is that due to some of the attendance concerns that we have to do this summer, or is it something other? Than well, I think at one point, um, the, the, we were doing more with the community at certain times uh, when we were meeting monthly. And before that, before I, I became a member, um, it was about the jail. And, uh, getting the jail up and going, so there was a lot going on. So but I think yeah. your your um, suggestion about let's really look at our, our goals and next steps, and maybe we can put that on the agenda for next time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I kind of feel a similar opinion. I, it really, I mean, we're changing it from six to four. It's not a terrible change in amount. So it's, I mean, I can see us if we want to continue doing the every other month, you know, maybe we could add another policy or two to, and like I said, maybe extend it as if needed. But um, I think it, for me, obviously, it's, I don't think it matters either way. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, do we need to even make a motion on keeping it as is? Then? Yeah, I mean, not if we don't want to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can keep it. Yeah, we'll just stay what we, with what we are. Well, we Here, can I, that's yes. one thing. I think Eric is right on revisiting. Like, why are we here? The why is a big deal. But either way, Tiffany communicates so thoroughly. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, I think it's going to be on our radar. Yeah. And so, just appreciate the way she communicates like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I, I think it makes either or. Bible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, for right now, then at least let's uh, keep it as every other month and uh, we'll see each other. Everybody here? But it's in October. <laughs> December. December. <laughs> Can't believe it's already going to be December. All right, Carla, thank you guys both for your input. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, go ahead and call that. Yeah. It is at uh, yeah, 648. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. See you all in December. Yeah, if not before. Well, yeah. <laughs>